Hi, this is Derek Jensen with the Progressive Radio Network and Resistance Radio. Um, my guest today is Stephanie McMillan. Um, hi, Stephanie. Hey, how are you doing, Derek? I'm doing okay. How are you doing? Fine, thank you. Good. Um, so, Stephanie is an activist, author, uh, cartoonist, and um, an all-around great thinker. And um, so, Stephanie, my first two questions, I guess, are what is capitalism and what's wrong with capitalism? Well, um, capitalism is a form of class society which has come to dominate the entire world in one global system where the whole of social production is done for the benefit of only a few. Class divisions have existed for the past 10,000 years, but what makes capitalism different from previous forms is the way that wealth is accumulated, which is through the exploitation of labor in the process of the production of commodities. Workers are not paid the full value of their labor. They produce more value than they receive as wages. And that extra labor power, which is stolen by the capitalist and is called surplus value, is embodied in the commodities and realized as profit when those are sold and reinvested as new capital. Wait, so can, the we, worker... can, can we stop for a second? Sure. And just give an example of that. It's like, and just make it up. It's like, because I remember okay. read, when I first encountered the surplus value thing, it really blew me away and helped me understand capitalism. But that, but there were some examples that helped. So somebody's working for ten dollars an hour, five dollars. It doesn't matter. Yeah, you're working for ten dollars an hour, and you're making boxes of frozen waffles. You're working in a factory, and you're producing in one hour. Well, the amount that you're paid is um, a, a wage that corresponds to the working day. So you're paid a certain amount, $80 a day. And you produce $80 worth of waffles in an hour, let's say. So the whole rest of the day, you're producing waffles for free. That the value of those waffles belong to the capitalist. It doesn't belong to you who made them. So every hour, you're producing $80 more of waffles times seven, which my math is bad, but whatever that is. You've produced that much surplus value for the capitalists. And the, the argument is that the capitalists deserve that because they're taking a risk with their money, right? Yeah, and because they own the factory. But the factory itself was made through the same process, and so it's congealed stolen labor from workers as well. Okay. Okay, sorry to interrupt. Go ahead. Oh, no problem. Um, the capitalists do have the most weapons usually and they take this stuff in the beginning <laughs> so that's why they claim to own it they conquer it that's that's the initial um the first part of capitalism is called primary accumulation and that's basically going out to somewhere and stealing money and resources and enslaving people so it's basically it begins as conquering and then once it's owned um they, they claim to have a right to it um, so anyway, capitalism involves the domination of this class over the working class, and it also involves the resistance of workers to that domination in a matrix of social relations that are manifested in political and ideological fields. So that's class struggle, and it shapes our everyday lives, everything we do. It shapes our taste in music, who we care about, what we wear, and eating that frozen waffle that's been microwaved. And produced like, in that factory is a manifestation of class struggle. So can you can you give more examples? Like you said, music. I don't. I'm I'm understanding you theoretically, but can you ground me here too? Like what what does that mean that it influences every every uh, every bit of our daily lives? Well, let's say you're standing in line to buy an iPod, the latest iPod. What makes you want that latest iPod? It's ideological domination that you need it. It's also the way that capitalism has integrated that into your life as something that you really feel like you do need that might be an integral part of how you carry on your existence. So all these things that are supposedly things we need, like the car, we need the car to get to work. That was a very deliberate plan to sell more cars. You know, the whole way that the highways are structured, the, the way cities are structured, the way we don't live near where we work, you know, that's to sell cars. So 
um, all these, the whole society, the way that it exists, has been shaped by the economic system that we live under and in, in its interest, in the interest of the class that dominates that system. Okay, okay um, good. So under capitalism, and I think we both see it this way, instead of people using machines, like a, a farmer using a hoe, machines are using people. And machines are the embodiment of previous labor power, like I mentioned before, which means that workers were exploited during their production. And now these machines, which are now called fixed capital, um, workers have become the appendage of them. And workers, the wages are now considered variable capital. So a worker is basically just um, stuck to the machine, an appendage of the machine. It has to work at the pace of the machine. Um, the worker has no choice about how to conduct their job or conduct production. They're just an attachment. So that's the that's what alienation means um, in that sense. Well, it reminds me of this line by uh, Frederick Winslow Taylor about a hundred and some years ago. About there's this really chilling line about in the past the man was first. Sorry about the sexism. In the future the system shall be first. And it's always cracked yeah. me up, like when, cracked me up is the wrong phrase, but it's always chilled me, you know, it's, it's always really struck me that, what's the point? You know, it's like when, when they talk about, like when there's NAFTA or any of these other so-called free trade agreements, they can, they can talk, or, or when they talk about environmental destruction, it's like, who, you know, it's a choice between destroying your water supply or maintaining um, this current use of energy, for example. And mm -hmm. they always choose the current use of energy, even when they're talking about something like poisoning your water supply. And that mm -hmm. just seems completely nuts to me. I don't understand how we can have rational discussions about that particular choice when we're talking about substances needed to survive. That's because humans are not in control of capital. The, the only reason that production occurs under capitalism at all is to produce more capital, for capital to reproduce itself. It's not, it's not concerned with what's useful or helpful or good, except insofar a little bit as the commodities have to have at least some use value for anybody to be motivated to buy them. But otherwise, capital is taken on a life of its own, as a self-perpetuating, ever-expanding social machine. And the reason that it can't stop expanding is because of competition among individual capitalists. So they, are, they have no choice about this. Unless they keep cutting their costs, increase their technological efficiency, and producing on an ever-larger scale, and also by cutting wages, that's their main um, goal, they'll be swallowed up by bigger and more ruthless capitalists. So it's a matter of their own survival. And this is what we hear all the time is that, oh, this community has to um, give tax breaks to Walmart because they're in competition with some other community for this. And so it's this, the phrase we always hear is this constant race to the bottom. Yeah, exactly. And it happens yeah. internationally, too, with what's the, you know, where it used to be that China was the cheapest labor, and then it was, what, Vietnam, and now it's Bangladesh. I don't know what the countries are, but it keeps... They keep finding a place, an, a, yet another place, where they can they can drive the wages down further. That's absolutely their yeah. That's their imperative. They have to. Um, and prison labor is another one. I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. Prison prison labor is another one. Right. Yeah. Um. Another reason that it has to expand and continuously expand even against all rational human interests and the interests of a living world is that um, most of the surplus value generated in the process of production isn't consumed because workers can't be paid enough as a whole to consume everything they produce or there wouldn't be any profit. So instead they reinvest it as new capital. So that increases the rate of production overall, too. And that's another part of the cycle that just makes it continuously built, build upon 
a larger base of capital than it started with. So the rate of expansion is enormous. And well, like you've said, hmm? go ahead, go ahead. You, know, you said a million times that there can't be infinite growth on a finite planet, and that is absolutely true. But infinite growth is exactly what capital requires and insists upon, and it will get it unless we stop it or unless it uses up and kills all life in the planet on the process. And even the capitalists can't stop that. They're not in control of it. And that's why it's so evil. You know, that was the second part of your question is um, the capitalists aren't stupid and they know they're on a suicide mission, but they can't do anything about it because capital itself has such dominance over society that under its logic, like you're saying, I mean, that it makes economic sense for farmers in New Mexico where there's a severe drought to sell water to fracking companies even though they know it's going to ruin their own farms and their drinking water, but they need to pay their bills right now. And maximum profit in the immediate right now is all that capitalism understands. And um, it doesn't care about the cost to the rest of the world. It doesn't care about the cost to everyone involved. It's relentless and voracious and never satisfied. And it must and will turn anything and everything else into itself. And like Dick Cheney said, and he's a very loyal representative of capital, he said this is non-negotiable. It's not that we he's non-negotiating our lifestyle, like he said, but it's that capitalist growth is non-negotiable. It forces everyone and everything into its matrix, and it kills millions of people through war and deprivation, it exterminates the natural world and turns dead objects, turns it into dead objects that fail, and it creates suffering and misery wherever it touches. And um, again, like you've written about a lot, if, if we don't stop it, it's going to exterminate life itself. And there's, there's a couple directions I want to go with this. One of them is... Um, so I'll tell you the two directions. The first direction is I want to go back to the crisis of overproduction stuff for a second. Uh -huh. And then after that, I want to, um, you know, we talk about all the, the, the bad things it's doing, but I'm wondering if we can talk about some version and of, you know, Mumford's Magnificent Bribe. You know, how, how do people go along with it then? So let's back up. First, the, the crisis of overproduction, because you mentioned that, and the idea is that, um, like you said, if if the workers can't buy all, if you're not paying workers the full value of what they're making, then they're actually producing more than the workers can buy. And when I first learned about that, that finally helped me understand, and of course there's many other reasons for it too, but that finally helped me understand why the U.S. military has to stay huge. Mm -hmm. Because those aren't consumer products. And so you're actually paying somebody 10 bucks an hour to build a missile that is set up specifically to, to be destroyed. It's not actually to be purchased. And so that's exactly. one of the safety valves for um, the overproduction. Is that right? It is. But they are making us consume it in a way because um, they make people pay for it through their taxes. So the money that the money that's actually going into the production is it's kind of like an, an enforced consuming rather than because they know we won't buy it on our own. We think we won't buy enough. So they're kind of forcing it. And also, yeah, they also that's why they print money also to keep things going because there's not enough of it coming from us. Um, and yeah, there's this requirement to make stuff and throw it away, and waste it, create chaos so that there's always new innovation. Um, well, I can, <laughs> given everything we've said so far, it sounds like capitalism is um, not a very, it's certainly not a sustainable system, and it's certainly not a just system, but apart from naked force, why I mean, why do why do people go along with it? Well, it starts with force, with incredible violence, you know, as we've seen with how um, nations are conquered, how lands are conquered, how people are conquered, it's still going on today. 
they won't even let the most isolated people live in the far reaches of a forest unmolested. They'll ha they have to go out there and, and incorporate them. And the way that they started was incredibly violent. Um, um, they always, the first thing they do is they'll go to a, a country where people are still working on the land and they'll find a way, they'll find a bunch of ways to get people off the land. And if, um, if they don't use force, they use a lot of other ways, like um, dumping commodities that are cheaper than peasants can produce so they can't sell their goods on the market and then they lose their land. Like they have a bunch of techniques for this. Or they'll, they'll say, oh, your animals have some disease that might spread to our country, so we're going to kill them all. And that destroys the, the peasant economy. And they have, they'll find a way to separate people from their means of subsistence and force them into the capitalist system. And then the people have to go to the cities and look for work. And um, when they're already metabolized and after a couple of generations and it seems normal, then they, I mean, there's also ideological domination. That's where that comes in. The whole idea of private property, why do we think that's okay? That's, that's ideological domination. We've been somehow this idea has been incorporated as something that's okay and rational and normal to have private property for some people to control how everybody else lives. Um, and then there's also um, politics where they set up all these institutions and laws and so and the, the idea that you're supposed to be compliant with them, that they're fair, you know, freedom means that you can accumulate as much as you want, freedom means that you can buy as much as you want, they, so brainwashing basically, um, and those who don't comply, they have forced to back it up. So I want to go back to the driving people off your land, and um, can you tell the story that you've told me before about there's a friend of yours from Bangladesh who not very long ago used to be able to fish? Yeah, well, it's a few decades now, but when he was a kid, his mom used to say, it's time for lunch, so can you go out and get a fish? And they could easily go out, and there were streams and rivers everywhere and, they, and ponds, and it would take like a minute to go out and pick up a fish because there were so many all over the place. And in fact, in that time, 70% um, of the food that was eaten it by people in Bangladesh was forage. It was just right there outside. It's like you didn't have to do anything to get it except go out there and get it. Um, but now, because of the domination of Bangladesh by international capital um, and the relentless drive to transform their way of life into something that's profitable for international capital, um, the the rivers have become poisoned um, by pesticides and fertilizers that have been foisted onto the peasantry, and now there are no fish in the rivers at all left. So they have to import fish from other parts of the world, and they cost something like 50 U.S. dollars for a good-sized fish that used to be free to catch outside. So people have, you know, it's a constant, um, a constant um, degradation of life. You know, people having to struggle harder and harder even to stay alive. And then it, a lot of people now have to send one of their children abroad to work and send money home because there's not a way to survive anymore in that country alone, you know, without um, somebody sending back some income. I think a lot about a letter that was written by a southern pro-slavery philosopher in the 1830s to his northern abolitionist buddy in which he laid out the conditions under which it was in the capitalist's best interest to own slaves versus to not own slaves. And it was really simple. It was um, if you have a lot of land and not many people on the land, then that means that the people have access to the land, which means they have access to food, clothing, and shelter, which means they have access to self-sufficiency, which means the only way you can get them to go to work for you is by physically enslaving them. Mm -hmm. And on the other hand, 
if you have a lot of people on not much land or if you can convince everybody that the land is actually owned, all owned by the rich people, then um, they don't have access to land, which means they don't have access to food, clothing, and shelter, which means they don't have access to self-sufficiency, which means they have to go to work for you for whatever pittance you want to pay them. Exactly. And that's for, exactly. For me, that yeah. always seemed the, 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 what happens at the frontier of capitalism. Mm-hmm. It's the first step is to deprive people of their means of subsistence, make them force them to be dependent on a job. Which has always suggested to me that wild food stocks like salmon, like um, the fish in those streams in Bangladesh, um, can't survive the logic of capitalism because why would I go to Safeway to buy food if I can just go out the back door? And once, you've, once they've made you dependent for food, that means you're going to be dependent upon the wage economy, which means you're going to have to dive into it. Right, right. And I think that's why um, climate change isn't such a problem for capitalism at all, because when there's less um, water available, when the air is polluted, when the food is poisoned, it, the prices of everything go up, and that's fine for capitalism. Why would they care? They don't care if people are suffering and starving and being poisoned and getting sick. They, and, in fact, that helps the medical industry as well. So you're – okay, before we, before we go to what should we do, let's talk for just a, a little bit longer about um, – I mean, people in the United States seem to believe, or at least the politicians seem to believe, the capitalism is the best and only and the most wonderful way. And if you criticize capitalism, then you'll be drowned out by chance of USA, USA. Um, mm -hmm. And so isn't it also true that um, capitalism has created lots of bounteous goodies for those who are on the inside of the, the on the inside of the gated fence. Oh sure, yeah. I mean what now that it exists and it's dominating our whole society, it's certainly more pleasant to be one of the ones being bribed to support it. Um, and the rewards are pretty good. They I mean, politicians, they get paid very well for saying those things and for promoting those things and for pushing capitalist interests. That's their job. And if they didn't do it, they wouldn't be, be in office. I mean, we can be sure that they would be unelected very quickly. Um, so, yeah, I mean, when we get um, perks in the United States, too, from imperialism, um, in some sense, you know, there's a large middle class here, uh, or there was anyway up until the financial crisis of 2008. But that's that's where it came from, basically, is the money flowing in um, through exploitation when the when the when production has been offshored. You know, money flows in and is able to pay for a middle class to form. So. Um What, what should we, what shall be done? <laughs> well, we can't reform it. We can't ask it nicely to go away. We can't ask it to change. We can't um, hope that it will change on its own. I think the only way to um, end capitalism is to overthrow it, and that means for the people who produce surplus value um, workers to take the means of production and um, put them in the hands of society as a whole. And for and this requires um, taking power as well for the people to led by the working class to take power away from the capitalists to define and dominate society. And that's really the only way to um, lay the basis for a society that, that we can actually 
organized in such a way that takes care of everyone's needs and is sustainable. We have to take it out of the hands of capitalists. I remember years ago Wes Jackson, hearing Wes Jackson say that um, Walmart was what was keeping the United States from having a revolution because people can buy cheap consumables there. So how, given the fact that one has to pay one's rent and given the fact that um, so many people are so thoroughly metabolized into the system, I mean, how, how does, how does, um, I mean, how do you get people to, I can see for the, for the very, very poor why they would rebel against the system that is literally killing them, um, as in the, 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 the communities where you were just talking about in Bangladesh, but, but what about, how do we get people who are the material beneficiaries, the people who, in the United States, who are probably listening to this, how do we get them to reject a system that brings them material benefits at the cost of the entire planet and the cost of misery everywhere? When they themselves have to pay their rent. And this is something I face with my work all the time. Well, I think um, the material benefits are kind of getting dubious. And the question more is the paying the rent part, you know, that, that people are, are, they have this choice whether they're going to go to work in the morning. They have to pay their rent. They have to buy food. They have to take care of their kids. And so they, they go to work in the morning. And I don't think it's, I think um, with the economic crisis, it's shifting from feeling like, uh, we have something to defend to we can't fight back because we depend on this economy and we need this job. So that's, that's to me, the biggest obstacle right there is um, the dependency issue. And It reminds me of a line by Kropotkin. That Kropotkin said that, well, he, said, he said it better than this, but basically that many revolutions have foundered because of bread. Yeah. And the yeah. notion is that you can have all these great ideas and you can talk about this wonderful new society, but the fact is if you don't have food for 60 days, you die. Right. Yeah. So an alternative has to be there for people, um, which I think can only be built through struggle itself. And the first step is acknowledging the problem, understanding the problem, and finding ways to organize. And that I know that we can't jump from what we have today to a revolution tomorrow because the population of the United States is very ideologically and politically dominated. Um, there's a very low level of consciousness about the nature of the system and what it might take to um, transform society. So. I think that by sounding the alarm and writing about it and talking about it and trying to organize around it, that's the approach that we can take right now because we're very weak. We can't overthrow capitalism tomorrow. We're, even though we, ha we face a very urgent situation with climate change, we can't accelerate the process with what we don't have. So. Um, that's why I think anybody who does understand this needs to be focused on organizing people and raising consciousness among people, you know, just uh, finding ways to explain what is the true nature of the, the cause of all this misery and all these problems and um, building organizations, building our strength. You know, capital is very organized. It's so organized. They run everything, and most people have no ability to organize anything. Um, so we have to flip that around so that we are able to organize everything and offer an alternative to capitalism. It's the only way we can offer an alternative. Well, I'm thinking three things. One of them is that um, part of the Irish struggle against the British 
the Irish struggle for independence against the British was um, like the Gaelic literature revival where they revived their, their, their own language and also setting up alternative court systems and alternative systems of justice to replace, the, to make it so they were not dependent on the British. And the, the mm-hmm. I hate using the word patriots, but the U.S. patriots, pre-revolutionary, the, the, the revolutionary, the Revolutionary War United States people is what I'm trying to say. Um, mm-hmm. They set up their own court system too, in parallel to the, um, the the British system, and mm-hmm. that's part, it seems, of a necessary process. So we not only have to take them down, but we also have to build up the alternatives. And that makes me think of the third yeah. thing. And you and I have talked about this before about. People recognize that, you know, the police are um, important enforcers of the status quo, but a lot of times if you talk to poor communities um, that, are, that are filled with a lot of um, non-capitalist violence, you know, a lot of, say, gang violence or whatever, that you can't you can't remove the police from those communities because the police are also protecting them. And so one of the keys would be to provide neighborhood, and the Black Panthers understood this, to provide, and the Spanish anarchists understood this, to provide community community protection before you can get rid of the police. You can't get rid of the police and just leave a vacuum. Mm-hmm. And right. It's seeming that that's the case, and that's the case. That's one reason. I know this is a very, very small thing, but that's one reason I'm really in, in favor of community-supported agriculture. Um, mm-hmm. Because that helps set up the alternatives, so that no matter how the system comes down, whether it's through peak oil or economic collapse or ecological collapse, the people have the alternatives in place. Yeah, for revolution. I think, yeah, I think you're right. I mean, I think that part of being able to defeat the system that exists is offering those alternatives on the political level, the court system, the police enforcement, or, you know, however you would want to call it, neighborhood defense would probably be called or something like that, Um, as well as in the productive level, you know, being able to feed ourselves and take care of our needs. Um, But I don't, the problem I see with focusing on those things is that you can't really build up a new society within the old only, I think it's a component, but without that emphasis on actually politically defeating them, and by that I mean through revolution, not through elections or anything like that, but actually it dominating them in turn, you know, um, through force, then they'll just simply crush any alternatives that start to appear. So part of that building alternatives have to be defending them and also being aggressively uh, assertive about them. Yeah, and, but not beyond your capacity. You know, you can't just go out there and start saying, well, we're going to have a new court system now. You have to be able to defend it. You have to be strong enough and well organized. Well, I, I completely agree, and that's that's a I completely agree, and that's a problem I have with a lot of the people who say, "Oh, if you just build an alternative, the old the old one will shiver, will shrivel, will shrivel up before your eyes." It's just that's that's simply not true, and doesn't happen. No, um, I mean there have been alternatives everywhere. There are alternatives now that are being attacked and killed and wiped off the face of the earth because they're alternatives. Yes. So, so a word you've said many times is organize, and you've done organize, organizing for many, many years. Can you talk about a, a couple things? One of them is, so what if I'm really loving everything you're saying, but I don't really know? I mean, the word organizing is so big and so scary, I don't know what it means. So can you talk about what it means to organize I and mean, what's, what's, what does one do? And can you also talk about some of the challenges that organizers would face um, and, and I mean, not just the challenges, but also the joys of it. Can you can you talk about organizing a little bit? Sure. In fact, this came up recently with um, someone I was talking to, who said, "Yeah, organize is a great idea, but how? You know, I don't even know what to say to people. I don't know what to do with them. Even if I have a few people who are interested, what what do we do?" So 
I think um, this is a very common problem because, and a common question because the the generation that is young now and apt to organize don't have an organic connection to any kind of mass movement that's ever existed. You know, they, there's been this generation break from the 1960s to now where the people who are active now did not witness that. So they don't have any models that they can continue or there's no, there's no continuity in organizations. Those organizations have all either disappeared or become irrelevant. So they have to start from scratch. And that's very difficult. And um, organizing basically means um, it entails people coming together for a common purpose. And it has to be done in real life and face-to-face. -face. It can't be just, like a lot of people think if they just put a Facebook page up and get a bunch of people to like it or participate in it, it that, that's organizing. That's not, that's good and it helps, but it's not organizing. Organizing, you have to do it, you have to collect people like through leafleting or you can find them at events, find out what they say online and then ask to meet them and work together building your organizational structure. So you hold events, domes, talks, uh, protests, whatever, as long as whatever those things are, you're gathering people closer to you and involving them in the building of the organization itself. So it's always getting bigger and you're always helping people to become more experienced. They're learning how to run things. These are going to be the embryo of a future power center. So you know, if we're talking about... Hmm? So, so setting up... so. Part of the point of doing a protest or an open mic or just anything that you might be going to do, part of the point is to simply get practice at doing it, as well as the actual attempting to stop this bad thing. Exactly. It's to offer that alternative, to build our own strength. Like, if you ima imagine if you had 10 people now who said, okay, we agree with your idea of having an alternative court system. Will they be able to pull it off without having worked together, without having actually tried to do anything together that or be effective in the world together? No, they probably would just be like flaky and disappear and not show up, and you don't and, even know. And nobody would be. And nobody would expect for somebody who has never picked up a basketball before to be able to um, make a shot. What you do is you practice, and that's how you become better. And it would be the same with this. So you couldn't expect somebody who's never done anything. I mean, you're going to do it, and then you're going to do a terrible job, and then mm -hmm. next time you do a slightly better job, and then eventually you do a pretty good job, right? Exactly, yes. And you're oh. at the same time helping other people build up their capacity as well. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, so that's what organizing is. It's All, all it is is face-to-face -face interactions and working on stuff together and building people for the purpose of defeating capitalism. So you're doing that ideological work, you're building political unity, and you're building organizational capacity. So mm -hmm. your, your activities can't just be anything. I mean, organizing um, a craft night is not going to get you any closer to defeating capitalism, but if you're organizing people to do activities that are targeting capital in some way, ideologically, politically, or whatever, then you're building an organization that could become an embryo of a new, a new power, a people's power. And targeting capitalism is really, is really a large-scale thing. I mean, so when you do organizing, it's not merely at the most large scale. You also oppose or work for some specific projects, like you've talked to me about a nuclear plant and also about, what was it, a stadium name or something? Those are some actions you've done lately? Well, those are things that people around here have done, and what we do, what I do when I approach um, a struggle like that and what the group I work with, One Struggle, does also, One Struggle is anti-capitalist, anti-imperialist, 
we will try to relate to different things that are going on about specific things and bring to it, instead of just getting involved and sucked into these struggles against what are actually effects of capitalism, we go and talk to people about why they're happening. You know, what is the cause of this thing happening? So um, bringing that consciousness to those places and then trying to organize on that basis. So I wouldn't immerse myself in specific short-term goals around what the effects of capitalism are, the evil things it's doing. I would instead find a way to work on those and integrate it into a larger movement against the system as a whole. Okay, that makes sense. Um, I was, I what, I, what I was trying to get at with that was just, once again, it's still like when you say we're going we're gonna to organize against capitalism, that still sounds really kind of big and scary to me, like when you just say organizing. But when you tell me how to organize, then it's like, well, that's not much different than organizing a dinner, except now you're not organizing a dinner. You're organizing you know, a protest, but it's still, I can, I can get a feel for it. And it's so, um, so you, you relate, you relate the other struggles to the larger struggle. That's one of, that's one of your niches. Right. Cause otherwise you end up just being issue oriented and targeting the effects. Like you're, you might be shooting out the tires of a car instead of cracking the engine block. You know, you're, you're not, targeting the actual problem. You're only targeting the effects of that problem or the peripheral, uh, you know, catastrophes being caused by the core problem. So, yeah, integrating those things together and figuring out ways to um, bring that consciousness to those struggles that this is part of an overall system that we need to change completely and not just this little thing here, this little thing this here, this little thing there, because that won't stop it. You can you can stop um, the Keystone XL pipeline and behind your back they've built a railroad system to transport even more oil than that. So you have to look at the entire thing. You, because still if you block the capital flow in one area It'll go around you, or it'll go through you, but it won't stop unless you stop it from the heart. So we have probably about um, five minutes or so left. Um, can you talk very briefly about the um, some of the struggles, or some of the difficulties that organizers will encounter? Just give your experience on um, you know what they can expect and how they can overcome it. And then also I'd like for you to mention you've got two books out coming this fall and just mention those. Oh, thanks. Um, the difficulties are many. Um, we can't expect it to be easy at all. And if you expect it to be easy, you'll be really disappointed and probably quit. Um, you need a lot of persistence and patience um, because especially with the low level of political consciousness, overall and the high level of ideological domination, you have a lot of people who really don't understand the necessity and so they might be attracted for a little while, they'll come and go, they'll not really make it a priority, So, but it's still necessary to work with a lot of people like that because this is who is there, you know. So. Um, and it takes a lot of work to break that ideological domination. So a lot of struggle. So I think just uh, total persistence and patience are required and hard work and focus. So, but, but cha yeah, I mean, I guess that's the biggest challenge. And then, of course, once you actually start to be effective, then you, you get the challenge of having to deal with a very vicious police state that is right there ready to crush you as soon as you become effective. Um, so that challenge is also there, which Occupy faced. You know, as soon as Occupy became, um, started to become an actual social force, they sent in, you know, they had the 
conversation between the mayors of the major cities with the FBI and Homeland Security, and they wiped them off the park and crushed it. And then the other half of them was the other half of the ruling class was out there trying to co-opt it. So you had them coming at it from both directions. So you have to be aware of those things and prepare for those things to happen. Co-optation is a big one. We have a lot of sincere progressive people who are offered jobs at NGOs, um, and they get sucked into basically social work instead of organizing people to fight for their livelihoods and for their rights. They're, they become um, basically consumers of charity instead. So that's one way that the system co-opts people and channels them into different directions. Um, telling people that the Republicans are so evil that you have to vote Democrat, that's another way. That's another part of ideological domination that we have to be able to help people overcome. Um, yeah, so the books, did you want me to talk about them or are you going to talk about them? No, I think you should, you should talk about them. I've got like two minutes. Okay, well, I have one coming out through Seven Stories Press. It's called The Minimum Security Chronicles, Resistance to Ecocide, and it's a graphic novel that sort of uh, it goes through a, a scenario of how a group of friends try to stop a geoengineering project and what, what works and what doesn't. And the other book is called Capitalism Must Die, and that's going to probably also come out this fall. Um, and it's an illustrated with cartoons um, text on what capitalism is and how we can stop it. <laughs> sort of like what we were just talking about, but in an expanded and more organized form with cartoons. So is there anything you'd like to leave the listeners with? Um, if you are interested in organizing at the anti-capitalist, anti-imperialist level, we have an organization like that called One Struggle. It's at onestruggle.net. And if you don't want to join One Struggle then, and you want to form your own organization but you want to talk with us and learn from our experience, then we welcome your communication. Okay, well, thank you so much. And I would like to thank listeners for listening to uh, Resistance Radio on Progressive Radio Network. Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you, Derek. It was a pleasure to be talking with you.